coach Tony Dungy joins us. And Tony, uh, it's funny, our producer Gary Carter said, when I was in the middle of this conversation with Jim Trotter, he said, uh, coach has checked in five minutes early, just like a coach. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> you already checked in. Since you were checked in, you heard our car, you heard part of our conversation about Sean McVay, and you've been in this situation. And like, who better to ask than you? You've uh, gone through this process. What do you hear from McVay, and what was it like for you when you decided to step away from football? Well, what I heard was last year after the Super Bowl and Sean having discussions, and is it time to go? So that that told me something right there. I think the Rams probably thought, hey, we give him an extension, add more money to it, it's going to change the way he feels, and it, it obviously hasn't. Um, we won our Super Bowl in 06, and I had been coaching – uh, shoot, 26 years at that time, and I thought it might be time for me to go. I had a long conversation in private with my wife, in private with our owner, Jim Irsay, and I decided to come back and, and coach another year or two, but you, you do think about it, and uh, I, I think that's where Sean is, and if you're thinking about it, I, I'll tell you, it's coming. It may not come this year, but it, it's coming pretty soon. Tony, I think... Um... From my standpoint, I think it's a, a great thing that coaches and players are now, because of the wealth that this league has has given to some, or that they've earned, I should say, um, can make life decisions based on quality of life as opposed to, hmm. I need to pay the bills. Do, do you hear guys talk about that more now in terms of their mindset? I don't think it's necessarily being able to pay the bills, Jim, but it is more of us thinking about life decisions and quality of life. Um, you just didn't have that years ago. And we weren't making as much money then, but we were still making enough. But more and more people are saying money is not the most important thing. And I know Sean McVay sitting there saying, yeah, I could make eight, 10, $12 million thing here uh, with the Rams. But is that really the most important thing? And for me, it wasn't. I was 53 years old when I, I stepped away and had a nice contract situation with the Colts, but I had some other things I wanted to do. I wanted to be at home a little bit more. I wanted to watch my son play college football. I wanted to do some charity work in the Tampa area. And uh, I was retiring to another lifestyle. It wasn't like, well, I need a break and I might come back. I knew when I stepped in that I was done. Uh, Tony, I want to, okay, if good. I could, I want to ask you, you went right. on social media after Lovey Smith was fired and you made your feelings felt about the Texans firing head coaches after or giving them one and done the past two seasons. Can you elaborate that more on, on, um, for our audience about why that's so devastating and, and detrimental in terms of trying to build success and the right culture within an organization? To me, when you hire a coach, it's a marriage and you're making a long-term commitment and you've got a plan. And supposedly two years ago, the Texans had a plan with they call it, hey, we know we've got some issues. We're not gonna be good. We're going to, we're gonna let JJ Watt go. We're gonna let DeAndre Hopkins go. We're going to build for the future. And David Culley went in there and they were competitive and they, they won a few games and they played hard and they said, oh, well, we're not good enough. So we're going to fire you. I don't like the direction we're going. Well, then they go through the same process and they come to Lovey Smith. Hey, we're going to let our franchise quarterback go. Deshaun Watson's got some issues. We're not going to deal with those. We're going to build for the future. We're going to get these number one draft choices down the road. And three years from now, we're going to be a really good team. We know we're going to take our lumps now. That's the plan. Well, it happens that way. And it plays out that way no different than anyone expected and now you blow it up again and say we're going to start over again well if you look at these guys they play competitive football kansas city chiefs are the number one seed in football they took them into overtime three weeks ago dallas cowboys they took them to the last play of the regular season they win a couple games they're fighting hard they're going to have draft choices down the road they're going to have a better quarterback they're going it's going to be better but after one year two times in a row you, you do that, it just doesn't make sense to me. And and I posted on my, my tweet, Chuck Noll was 1-13. and 13. Uh, gosh, Jimmy Johnson was 1-15. and 15. Um, Tom Landry was 0-11-1. and 1. You know, you can't judge after one year, especially when you've said 
we are building for the future. So how do you make decisions in one year? My question is who in their right mind is going to go there now, unless it's a big mm -hmm. long-term guaranteed deal. Well, well, I was just going to say, I was going to say that Tony, that, that is exactly where I want to go because I said yesterday when Michael Smith was on, you know, there are 32 of these jobs and as, and I'm with you, I, I, I share your opinion a hundred percent across the board, how you feel about the situation. Uh, it's outrageous, but there are 32 jobs. And if the Texans come to you and you want your opportunity, you almost have to take, you can't turn it down because that may be your only opportunity to, to get a head coaching job. Who knows? So is that the approach to take? Do you protect yourself? If you're the next head coach, do you make them pay? Do you say, okay, I got to have an eight year contract. It's got to be fully guaranteed. I got to have red M&Ms over here and the yellow ones there. I got to have limits like everything. How, how do you approach that when you know they've done this with their last two head coaches? How would you do it? Chuck Noll told me something when I first started working for him in 1981. I was 25 years old. He said, you're going to have opportunities in this league to move on. So let me give you one piece of advice. Never take a job based on the job title or the money they're going to pay you. Take your job Ooh. based on who you're going to work with, who you're going to work mm. for, what you're going to learn, and what type of organization you're going to be in. And I've seen people Ooh. take jobs for $10,000 more. And it didn't turn out well. I've seen people take jobs because I'm going to be the defensive coordinator. I'm going to be the head coach. And it's not the right thing. So I, that's what it me today. I would advise to take a look at who you're going to work for, who you're going to work with, what their track record is. It might not be the best job for you. That is so powerful. So powerful. That's great. And so true. That's great advice. And, but, Tony, how hard is it for particularly young coaches to – to heed those words of wisdom. Well, it's tough because you don't know when you're going to get that opportunity. But the other side of the coin is you have to have a gut feel about who, you know, you have to interview them. Because I can tell you this, 25 years ago when I went to Tampa, people were saying the same thing. Oh, it's a graveyard for coaches. They, you know, it's going to be two years and you'll be gone. Don't take that job. Well, I talked to Rich McKay and I talked to Jerry Angelo and we had uh, an understanding and I liked where they were. And yeah, things hadn't gone well, but it was a back and forth. Now, uh, is it going to be that way? Can people fool you in an interview? Sometimes, but I, I would have to ask some serious questions about the direction we're going. And I'm sure Lovey asked those questions. I'm sure David Cully asked those questions, but that's what you'd want, want to know if you're going to interview anywhere, but particularly there when they've got a track record of two one-year stops in a row. Uh, you, you've mentioned the Steelers a couple of times, and rightfully so. Uh, you, you won some championships there. You, you coached there under the great uh, Chuck Knoll. Uh, worked for the Roonies. I mean, it's a strong organization. And you think about the contrast, Tony, the Texans, two years in a row, one and done, one and done. And the Steelers, and I just want you to put this in context because I, I can't find the words for it. I know you know uh, better than we do. Mike Tomlin, again, a winning <laughs> record. They're nine and eight. Ben Roethlisberger retired. Mitch Trubisky was their starting quarterback. They move on from Trubisky. They put a rookie in there and Kenny Pickett. It looked like they are out of it. And their last game of the season, if not for uh, uh, you know, a couple of things going, you know, Miami winning the game on a field goal, essentially. They got a safety at the end. Steelers would be in the playoffs. So how do you put Mike Tomlin in context? Because it's a pretty amazing streak. Never had a losing season. Well, and, and it comes down again. Who are you working for? Who are you working with? What is the organization all about? At, at one point, Pittsburgh is three and five. Well, some people are firing their coach at three and five, you know, in the middle of the season. And there's no panic in Pittsburgh. We know what we're doing. We're going to play this young quarterback and we're going to grow. I can remember... Uh, when I was young, Dan Rooney telling me, hey, I knew we had the right man in Chuck Noll when we were 1-13. and 13. That's when I knew I had the right guy because of how he handled that situation. And I'm sure they wow. feel the same way about Mike. We know we've got the right man when we're in these tough times and everybody else around is panicking. And Mike Tomlin is just saying, no, we're going to stay the course. The standard is the standard. And here we go. I love that. Um, me too. Yeah. Tony, tell me if I should be bothered by this, that 
we saw the job that Brian Flores did in Miami. And we know now that he, he's in Pittsburgh as a, a defensive assistant. And now teams are saying they want to interview him as a defensive coordinator. And I'm asking myself, why aren't these teams interviewing him for a head coaching job? Since we saw what he did in Miami in terms of turning around that franchise. Do you also wonder about that as well? Um, you know, I, I think right now, Brian is in a situation where people are going to be a little bit hesitant. So, so that does make you wonder, but there's also, you know, that situation where you've got to know what you're looking for. And you may be looking for Brian Flores as a defense coordinator and not as a head coach. And to me, that's okay. Um, I go again, I go back to Pittsburgh and Dan Rooney, when he hired Mike, he had four really high quality offensive coaches on his staff at that time. Um, Bruce Arians was on his staff, and Bruce would go on to take a team and win a Super Bowl. Ken Wisenhunt was on that staff, and he would take a team to a Super Bowl. But Dan Rooney went outside, and he hired Mike Tomlin because he was going to follow his blueprint. And his blueprint was, I hire young, great, communicative, defensive coaches. That's what I'm looking for. So the fact that he didn't interview Ken Wisenhunt, he didn't interview Bruce Arians, I, that that doesn't bother me. So I could see a team saying, you know what? Brian Flores may not be exactly what I'm looking for as a head coach, but as a defensive coordinator, I love it. And that's okay. But, um, you know, we, we'll see. We'll see what, what happens with Brian and where he goes. He should get an opportunity down the road in these next couple of years. He really should. Well, one more thing, Coach and Michael. This is this is my therapy session with Tony because I, I always look right, for good. his words of wisdom to talk me yeah. off the ledge because I, I can be a little emotional at times. But, Coach, tell me why I should not be bothered that David Tepper did not go to the Carolina Panthers' final game if for no other reason than to say to Steve Wilkes and those players, thank you for the job that you did after a 1-4, 1-5 right. start. Oh, well, this is the first time I'm hearing this, and I, I don't know that I've ever heard of an owner not at one of their games, no matter what the situation is. So that that surprises me a little bit. Um, they were very close to being playing that game for a playoff spot. Uh, maybe there was the disappointment there. I don't know, but to me, if you're an owner, you've got to be there with your team. If you're zero and fifteen, you got to be there. So uh, that, that's disappointing for me to hear. Uh, my, my final question for you, uh, Tony, uh, it involves the game that you're going to be at. You're going to be there regardless of the situation. You will be there, Tony. It is a playoff game. Uh, it is the Chargers and Jaguars, and it speaks to a lot of things. Uh, the Chargers finally kicked down the door and get into the playoffs. They were so close last year and the Jaguars bring in Doug Peterson. Who is who doesn't make it about himself brings some stability yeah brings some confidence and they win their division after a three and seven start what are you looking for what are you looking to see uh in this uh four or five matchup between these teams i am so excited because you've got um star power quarterbacks young quarterbacks who are going to be the face of the league uh going forward you've got uh exciting young defensive players and you've got a team in jacksonville that kind of did what we, we think you should do you you draft your quarterback you build around him but then you put some pieces to the puzzle there and i love what they did in free agency they didn't go out and get the hundred million dollar star player they got some hungry guys who wanted to be there and wanted to be part of a winning group and they're playing with with energy and passion and then they got a, a coach who uh, had been to a Super Bowl, a coach who knows how to put things together, and as you said, a coach who doesn't make it about himself. Uh, I, I actually made a call to the Jaguars organization after everything blew up last year, and I said, you need some stability. And there's a couple of people I could recommend. One of them was Doug Peterson. The other was Jim Caldwell, the same type mm. of guy that would have done the same mm. type of job uh, with a young quarterback, coaches who had been to Super Bowls, and been successful and built offenses and, and mentored quarterbacks. Um, and, you know, it ended up being Doug Peterson, and that's great. I believe Jim Caldwell could have done the same thing. 
I believe Jim Caldwell could do the same thing in Denver. If I talk to the Denver people, that's who I would hire. But we'll see what happens. Huh. Well, Tony, I, I don't, I don't want to lead you down a, uh, a path where we could all get into trouble, but it bothers me a little bit that I see Why not? a bit of. Why not? Come on. Well, Come on, Jim. No, Go here's ahead. my thing. When Tony, mentions, when Tony mentions Jim Caldwell, there's no question to me Jim Caldwell should be a head coach in the NFL right now. But all I keep hearing from owners and teams right now is that owners want to go younger, you know, and they want to get that fresh face and that name. And all of a sudden, these coaches like Jim Caldwell or Leslie Frazier or Steve Wilkes or others aren't really being talked about or considered for these jobs. And so I'm not going to sit here and say age discrimination, but it sure feels like some of that's going on in the NFL right now. And I don't know if you want to comment on that, Tony, because I had another question for you. But if you want to, the floor is yours. Yeah. Let, let me comment on that one first. And let's go to exhibit A, Sean McVay. Sean McVay is in his 30s talking about leaving the game. So don't don't say that, well, I need a young guy because Jim Caldwell might only be there six or seven more years. And I don't know what you, you got hired a 30 something that took you to one Super Bowl and might be leaving. So. Uh, get stability, get good people, and don't worry about that. Steve Wilkes, Leslie Frazier, Jim Caldwell, Doug Peterson. Hey, nothing wrong with that group of people. Absolutely. Tony, lastly from me, can you put into perspective what Brock Purdy has done with the 49ers? That is the most unbelievable thing I've seen. For a young quarterback to come in yeah. in a pressurized situation like that, to play good, solid football, not turn the ball over, not look like a rookie. Um, it, it's amazing. Uh, you have to credit Kyle Shanahan and that offensive staff, but Brock Purdy must have something in, inside him that nobody saw. I mean, you'd have to think, and are we seeing the Tom Brady, that low round guy that we didn't see all this, we didn't anticipate this. Uh, he's playing spectacular football in my opinion. You know, uh, Tony, I, I, I think I told Tony this story already, Jim, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you and him again. So last year, uh, NBC has a Super Bowl and I had an opportunity to kind of jump on the coattails of that coverage. So I'm on that coverage and we have we do a spot. Michael Smith and I do a spot. It's right before Tony uh, comes in and kind of it's a cleanup hitter. You know, we got on base. And Tony came in, and, you know, and brought us in. So my mother in Ohio is watching it. She said, oh, I saw you on TV. This is great. I said, Mom, what was your favorite part of seeing me on TV? She said, you know what my favorite part was, son? My favorite part was Tony Dungy said, Michael Holly said. Tony Dungy mentioned your name. That was my favorite part of it. She's a big man. Well, so uh, listen, she sees her son this, on Michael. national TV and she shouts out Tony Dungy. No, it, it, I can understand Thanks, why. Mom. Look, when I in teaching my class, like I said, I wanted to talk to the students about integrity, about a professionalism, those sorts of things and why they're important. So who's the one person I reached out to to see if they would be interested in speaking? Tony Dungy. And he was tremendous. They all loved it and took a lot from it. So I thank you again for that, coach. We appreciate you. We You're appreciate you for, for teaching for teaching in the classroom and in the studio as well. Look forward to uh, your coverage for the uh, Chargers Jaguars game. Thanks for joining us. All right. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Always fun being with you. Absolutely. Hey, thank you for watching brother from another. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, go ahead and do that now. Don't forget you can catch us three to four weekdays on PeacockTV.com and on Sirius XM Channel 85.